So last week I posed a question. I said, what if 2023 could be a year of pursuit? I mentioned that, that I'm feeling and have for the last few years that, that God is asking me, and I believe asking us as a church, to, to not just be aware of him, but to passionately pursue him. And, and I asked the question, what would it look like for you to jump on that? And this has been something that's been on our hearts ever since we've been in Toowoomba. We've talked about this concept of passionately pursuing Jesus, that it being an in- intentional walk with him, not a, not a sit back and just let things happen. And, and so I, I wonder what that would be like for you. And I asked that question last week, and we realised that pursue is, a, is an intentional word. It means to go after. It means to be relentless. It means to press on. It means to be intentional. And, and so today what I wanted to do is to keep going with that theme and talk about and really teach this morning. So we're going to look at a lot of scriptures. Um, that that um, version Bible app, if you jump on that, go into events, you'll find I'll put a bunch of scriptures in there. Some I won't share this morning because we just won't have time. But I really want to teach around two spiritual disciplines. How many don't like the word discipline? <laughs> Hopefully we'll change your mindset on that by the end of today. But I'm going to talk about two spiritual disciplines that... Um, are a great way for us to pursue God, to seek after God. And these two disciplines, when I mention them to you, only two today, but both of them are ones that aren't, don't come naturally, well, I don't know about you, but they don't come naturally to me. But how many know that when we're intentional, we press into something that doesn't come natural, God does something supernatural? I don't know about you, but I find that for me. When he knows it's a sacrifice, he does something in the midst. And so Paul writes about this concept of spiritual discipline. And I love the way he writes because I hear the word discipline and go, oh, I don't know if I like the word. But then when I read in 1 Corinthians Paul's letter and he, and he sort of compares it to an athlete, a footballer or a runner or a cricketer or insert your sport here, then I go, oh, I, I can relate to that. This is what he says. He says, don't you realise, this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. He says, don't you realise that in a race, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. Who's competitive here? I love these verses because it's like, yep, run to win. Okay, so run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it. We run the race of life to win for for an eternal prize. So run with purpose. Love it. Run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete training to do it, to do what it should. You see, our bodies are created for a purpose. And when we train our bodies and we train our minds and we train our spirits and our souls, we start to live the way we should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So this morning, how can we run the race of life to win? to truly pursue and seek after the things of God, to not just know about him, but, but know him even more, that this year would be a year where I, I'm going to really truly know you more and I'm going to start to respond. You're here this morning. I believe God's brought you here this morning, whether this is your first time, whether you're still checking High, Highlands out or whether this is, this is home, this is family. But I believe God you ha- has you here for a purpose this morning. And I believe he wants to reveal his heart to you about himself first and foremost, and about you, and what does it mean to do life together. Richard Foster, in a book called Celebration of Discipline, it's this book here, and there's an image of it on the screen. His book's called Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth. It's a book, and it touches on three different types of disciplines. That's the book. I'd encourage you, if, you, if this sort of at the end of today, you feel like, I want to know more about that. I want to do a little bit deeper of, of understanding of this. a great book by Richard Foster. But he talks about three types, and he talks about inward spiritual disciplines. And the inward spiritual disciplines are things like prayer and study and meditation and fasting. And I shared a couple of those inward disciplines last week. He also talks about outward disciplines, like simplicity, like solitude, like submission. And then the third area he talks about is what he calls corporate disciplines. And that, their areas like confession and worship, like we have this morning, where we've worshipped corporately together, and celebration and service. 
And as I mentioned last week, I looked at two of the inward ones, prayer and fasting. And today what I want to do is I want to look at and unpack and teach you and do two of the outward disciplines. Two that I know you're going to be fired up as soon as you hear them. <laughs> We're going to teach you into solitude. And we're going to teach you into submission. Lock the doors. Don't let anyone run out now. Because <laughs> I know when I hear the word submission, it's like it's not, you know, talk to me about growth, talk to me about leadership. And I'm like, yeah, I'm with you, Murray. Submission is like, whoa, hang on. <laughs> really? But you know what God did in my heart as I've been preparing for today? He showed me the freedom that comes. The freedom that comes. He showed me the freedom that I can experience. He showed me the freedom that you can experience if you consider these two spiritual disciplines. So I can do nothing but teach into this because my desire for my life and for your life is that you would experience freedom in the things of God. You see, my sense here this morning is that many of us need to hear from God. We need to hear from God about a situation, a circumstance, a pathway, a lifestyle, the way 2023 looks, work, career, studies, whatever it might be. We need to pursue him. You're going to hear the word linger. I feel like God wants us to linger a little longer with him. He wants us to press in, to listen, to stay a little longer. And so later this morning, just to give you a heads up, we're going to create an opportunity for you to linger longer with him. We're going to create an opportunity for people to be prayed for. We've moved the chairs back a little bit. We don't do this every Sunday. But just feel God's laid on my heart that, that he wants us to respond to him this morning and just to come in a place of submission and seek him and linger with him and let people pray for us and over us. And so I just want to let you know, give you a heads up, we're going to create some time later on this morning for that to happen. But I was prompted in my prayer to ask this morning, what limits have you put on yourself in 2022 that need to be blown off in 2023? What are the limits that you put in place where God wanted to smash through them, but you, you put limits on your life and opportunities and experiences and you didn't, maybe didn't mean to or maybe you did, but God's saying enough. Enough of that. I want to blow those out open. In 2023, I want you to experience things that you've never experienced before. I'm going to remove those limits. What's distracting you right now? What's polluting your life right now? What's negatively impacting your life this season? You see, God wants you and I to live a healthy life, a prosperous life. These are not just nice ideas. This is biblical truth. He wants you to be healthy, physically, emotionally, spiritually. He wants you to prosper in all things. He wants you to live a victorious life. Now, I know I say that and some of you go, well, I'm not experiencing that. I don't, I don't know that that's true, Murray. I'm hearing it, but I don't know if that's true. Oh, let's jump into the scriptures. Let's see what God says to you about your life and about the victory that he wants you to experience. We're going to rush through a few of them here. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has given me victory. He's He's given me, give me victory, Lord. He's given me. Victory. This is my God and I will praise him. Next one, let's race through them because there's lots there. Psalm 62 verse 7. My victory and honour comes not from who I am, not from what I do, not because I, I speak really loud or I'm really forceful, or I'm enthusiastic, or I'm an extrovert, or I'm an introvert. My victory and honour come from God alone. He is my refuge. He is a rock where no enemy can reach me. 1 Corinthians 15, so we go into the New Testament now. So these are, these are the apostles. They were the, that was, yeah, well, that was Old Testament, Murray. That was when God was, what about after Jesus? What about when Jesus walked the earth? What about after that? But thank God, he, Paul says, he gives us victory over sin and death through the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that gets me fired up. I have victory over the sin that is tempting my life every day. I have victory over death. I can have eternal life. That's a promise God gives me. Next one. 1 John 4, 4, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you, because of the Holy Spirit, because of Jesus who lives in us, is greater than the one who is in the world. We have victory. We have victory. One more. 
Oh, no, I don't think that's there. But 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, We achieve this victory through faith. See, I love this because God says, You have victory in your life. And all you need to do to experience it is to accept Jesus, my son, and follow him. It's not to be a better person. It's not to, to, to be the person who reads the Bible more than anyone else or prays more than anyone else. So reading the Bible and prayer are really important about getting to know God and getting to know Jesus. But it's when we say, my faith in my life is now given to you, Jesus. Then victory is given to you. See, God is calling you and I to live out a victorious life. See it. Hear it. Believe it. And speak it out prophetically over your life. I believe in the power of words. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Speak that out. That's truth for you and truth for me. Not because of who I am, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is when you accept him as your Lord and your Saviour. He wants you to know this, not just know about it, but know this truth and be assured. And the way that you can be assured in the victory is when you linger with him in prayer. How many know that when you spend time with the Father and you spend time with him, he builds a godly confidence in you? I know he does for me. And it's not a confidence in me. It's a confidence knowing he leads, guides and directs my life. So the victory he's given me, I start to experience and appreciate, not because of who I am, not because of my role as pastor, because I am fallible. I fall short of the glory of God every day. That's truth. But I have faith. I have faith in my Father God. And I'm thankful for Jesus who died for me and rose again, that I might have life and have it everlasting, that I might walk in the victory that he's given me. And I need to speak that out continually. So if I understand that victory, and I know the way to understand it and experience it is to pursue God and to linger in God's presence, then part of that is embracing these two disciplines I'm going to talk about this morning. And so let me get into them. The first one leads me to the discipline of solitude. Ecclesiastes verse five, uh, chapter 5 and verse 1 says this. It says, draw near. It's talking about draw near to God. Draw near to God to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter wor a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are upon the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Draw near to him and listen, because he's God, creator of the universe. Again, in, in Foster's book, he says, he's quoted as saying this, he says, the less we are mesmerized by human voices, the more we're able to hear the divine voice. I need to hear that. Mesmerized by human voices. Oh, Murray, that was amazing. You're an amazing leader. Oh, Murray, you know, the way you spoke. Oh, Murray. And, and it's lovely to be encouraged. I'm not saying encouragement's not good. Don't stop encouraging. <laughs> but when it becomes all about that and we get mesmerized by that, then we're looking for the voices of people. When Foster really beautifully says, don't get mesmerized by that, because if you do, you're, you're going you're gonna to miss what God says. But the less you're mesmerized by human voices, the more you'll be able to hear the divine voice. And then he says, the less we are bound by others' expectations, the more we are open to God's expectations. I love it. Saying, are you going to follow person, man, woman, or are you going to follow me, Murray? What's more important right here, right now? See, a fear of being left alone petrifies people. So when you hear solitude, you start to get fearful because like, that, that worries me. Our fear of being left alone drives us into noises and it drives us into crowds and it drives us into places and spaces where there's lots of white noise. Because for some of us, even the thought of being alone petrifies us. This morning I want to say to you that if you've invited Jesus into your life, you're never alone. You're never alone. He will never leave you and never forsake you. And he wants to spend time with you. And so solitude isn't about being alone. Solitude is setting yourself apart, either physically or even spiritually, to be with him and to hear from him. But the fear of being left alone petrifies people. And so we have music strapped to our arms when we're walking or running. Or we have podcasts in our ears. Or we, we, um, we have our phones with us always and things are going on. We're busy doing and we put the phones down. 
Put the technology down. Turn the TV off. Turn the radio off. What would it look like just to be? To be still and know that he is God. But if we cultivate this inner solitude, this inner silence, it sets us free from loneliness and fear. Seems countercultural. But if you have a fear of being alone, set yourself apart with Jesus and watch what he speaks into your heart. And watch what he builds in your heart as you seek first the kingdom of God. See, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude brings inner fulfillment. It's a different thing. It's a different thing. Solitude isn't a place. It's more a state of the heart or a state of mind. So I can, I can be busy in my day, set myself away, set myself apart, and I can experience solitude with Jesus. Sometimes, and I'll speak about it in a moment, it, it is a matter of getting away to that favourite place. But you can experience solitude, the, the solitude that God wants, by a state of mind and a state of heart that removes your mindset from the, on your heart from the business of life to be with him. There is solitude of the heart that can be maintained all the time. Crowds or lack of crowds have little to do with this inner attentiveness when we're called to seek solitude. You see, it's quite possible for a hermit who lives alone always to never experience solitude. And it's quite possible for somebody whose calendar is always full to regularly be experiencing solitude. See, it's a state of mind and a state of heart when we seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus calls us from loneliness to solitude. And what I love is Jesus lived with this inward heart solitude. But as well as an inward heart solitude, Jesus modelled that so well. He also modelled an outward solitude. He did it many times. Matthew chapter 14, I don't think these are on the screen, but, but uh, they'll be in the, in, the, in the app. Matthew 14, 13 says, Jesus withdrew from there in a boat to what he called a lonely place being set apart. Matthew 14, 23, Jesus went into the hills by himself. Mark 1, verse 35, in the morning, a great while before the day, Jesus rose and went out to a lonely place. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 says, Jesus withdrew to the wilderness and prayed. Yeah, but Murray, that's Jesus. I'm, I'm a busy person. Jesus knew that his time on this earth was short. Yet he followed the Father's will. Not, come on, we've got to get these done, disciples. Come on, Peter, catch up. We've got to do all this stuff. He followed the Father's heart and the Father's will. He saw what was important. And he regularly, outwardly sought solitude. I need to separate. I need to step away. Not just to get away from people. The motivation wasn't because I need to get away from people because my wife's really annoying me at the moment. Just going from some spiritual solitude, Dial. That's not the motivation. That's not the motivation. The motivation is to set aside to seek the Father. You know, he kicked off his ministry with 40 days alone in the desert. Before he chose his 12 disciples, he spent an entire night alone in the desert hills. When he received the news about John the Baptist's death, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place to be apart to grieve with the Father in solitude. After feeding the 5,000, Jesus went up to the hills by himself. When the 12 returned from preaching and healing, the healing mission, Jesus instructed them, come away by yourselves to a quiet place. And then just before he gave his life, he sought solitude in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to Holy Week. Time after time, Jesus is modelling this and he's teaching his disciples the, dis the discipline of solitude. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, Life Together, the classic exploration of faith and community, faith and community being together, he teaches this. He says, let him who cannot be alone be aware of community. Let him who is not in community be aware of being alone. I love that. He says, he says if you're, you're embracing community fully and that's all your life's about, be aware. Because there are moments where you need to seek solitude. And then he says, and if you're always alone and you're never in community, you be aware too. So he's not saying community is not important. We, we embrace community here. It's such an important value here. Hopefully you've felt loved, accepted, greeted, welcomed. 
naturally, not just because that's what the church does, but there's a heart in this place that says, you know, you're welcome here. You matter. It's part of what we say. So hopefully he's experienced that. But I love what Bonhoeffer says. And he goes on, he says, each by itself has profound perils and pitfalls. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the deep void of words and feelings. And the one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation and despair. Pretty powerful words from Bonhoeffer. But he talks about the power of both, community and solitude together. Both are essential. Crowds or the lack of them have little to do with this inner attentiveness to the things of God. And I think that's what God's saying to us. Be attentive to me and set aside moments in your day, in your week, in your month, in your year where you are. You, you take your heart, you take your mind and you be still and know that he is God. And I'm sorry, but I don't care how busy you are. And I don't want this to sound judgmental because we will always say, Murray, I'm just so busy, I don't know where I can, I can fit that in. None of us are too busy to meet with the Father. They can be little solitudes that fill our day. That early morning moment before the family wakes. If you're a mum, a young mum, and maybe there's one awake and he, she woke you up, then maybe in that moment of feeding, that can be a still and know that I am God moment. In those early mornings before the family wakes. Maybe it's over that morning coffee before starting the day's work. Rather than reading the paper or jumping on your email. Maybe at that cafe with that coffee. God, you're with me. What do you want to say to me today? Moments of solitude. Maybe it's the solitude of bumper to bumper traffic during rush hour. Where you turn the frustration of bumper to bumper traffic into, this is going to take me longer than I thought. Be still and know that you are God. God, what would you say to me today? What do you want to say to me today? Maybe before a meal, invite everyone to join in a few moments of gathered silence before grace. Hey, we're about to say grace, but before we do, let's just take a moment of solitude with hearts to seeking him. None of us can say we can't do any of this. I don't believe how busy, no matter how busy you are. Maybe it's finding new joy and meaning in short walks. Maybe it's walking outside just before bed and tasting the silent night. Where our bedroom is, we've got this very, really little kind of a Juliet balcony. And some nights before I go to bed, I just walk out. And, and to, the, the nights at the moment have been so clear. And I'll walk out and no matter even if it's been warm, just the, the fresh, cool breeze that Toowoomba rings once the sun goes down. <laughs> Do you like the way I put that? beautiful friend and 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 just looking up and it might just I might just be out for a minute or two my kids might be having a shower or whatever I'm just out there and I'm just God's presence rather than right bedtime boom, 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 I'm in my rhythm I'm in my routine be still and know that I am God Spanish nun and religious trans, um, reformer St. Teresa of Avila says this settle yourself in solitude and you will come upon him in yourself how beautiful is that? Settle yourself in solitude. Stop racing and just settle in this moment and you will come upon him in yourself. Just let that, let that linger. See, solitude is not running away from people or problems. I know there are some people going on prayer retreats and what have you. What's the motivation? Is it to get away from your problems? Is it to get away from your people? Is it to seek God? Is it to be with him? It's a solitude of the heart. Sometimes it is finding a quiet place, like a room or a chair or a tree in a park or shower time or a cafe where you do set some time apart and you go to that place that helps you to experience solitude. Listen. I love this phrase. Listen. I don't know where I... I did not write this. I'm not sure where I got it from, but it's, it's not from me. Listen to the thunder of God's silence. In solitude, listen to the thunder of God's silence. He calls us to a place of silence, and sometimes it is a place of silence completely. But then there's the nudge, or there's the whisper. 
Dutch writer Henri Nouwen said this, he said, without solitude it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. If you're wondering, many theologians would say the same thing. Without those moments, whether they be long or short, of solitude, it's impossible to live a life spiritually because you're not hearing the voice of God. You're not consciously and in intentionally seeking him out. It's a discipline. It's not going to just happen. That's why they call it discipline. What would it look like for you to grab a hold of that discipline in 2023 and start to share what God's saying to you in those quiet moments of solitude? First discipline, solitude. Second one, I'm only going to do two today. The second one is the discipline of submission. I want to start this by saying, and I mentioned it earlier, this has not been an easy one for me to study. Sometimes leaders find it hard to submit. But when I've studied this and understood what God's idea of submission is, submission is the only way to find freedom. If you want freedom from the situation or circumstance you're in right now, maybe God's calling you to the discipline of submission. Letting go. Stop trying to do it on your own and let go. And many of the women are saying yes, amen, and many of the men are going... And I'm not saying this is, this is necessarily a male or female thing. Uncross your arms, Jace. <laughs> Whether this is a male or... <laughs> Jace, a friend of mine, I can stir him. I'm not saying this is a male or female thing, but so often submission, we think, oh, you know, I've got to be in control. And God says, let me be in control and watch the freedom that I bring. Real quick, the ability to lay down, this is what submission is, it's the ability to lay down that terrible burden of always needing to get things my own way or if it's done in my time. Submission is saying, I'm going to let that go, God, your, your will and your timing. And watch what he does in terms of bringing freedom into your life. We sang a song this morning <clears throat> that talked about the narrow road leads to life. You know why the narrow road leads to life? Because we don't choose it. We want to pick the wide road that's really easy to walk and it's really simple. And God says, follow me. And he says, and I'm going to go through a few scriptures in a moment, take up your cross and follow me. He says, walk the narrow road, walk the tough road, walk the road I lead you down, submit your walk to me and watch what I do in you, watch what I do through you, watch what life looks like. When we, when we, when we walk and we step into this discipline of submission. You see, in the discipline of submission, we are released to drop the matter and forget it and trust God. We don't let the things that get us mad, that make a fuss, where we fume, where we worry, where we get anxious, where we get depressed, when something doesn't go our way, we don't let that to, 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 to bubble, we submit it to God. We submit it to God. Only submission to God will bring you freedom. That's truth. You're struggling with something right now? When you truly submit it to God, he will bring you freedom. That's the promise. And it's the only way you'll get freedom. See, he teaches us not to hold on to things tight. Stop holding on to your business so tightly. Hold it loosely and watch what God does. Stop holding to those, onto those relationships so tightly because you're fearful about, well, what if I let that go? What will happen? And let God look after who you should spend your time with. Stop holding on to, I need to, drive, I need to run my business this way because this is the way I know is the only way I can do it. And if I need to be a little bit forceful and maybe occasionally drop, drop some swear words because they need to know, if I, I've got to do that because that's the way I get them doing. What if, that, if you stopped holding it tightly and you let it loosely and you said, why don't you lead the way I want you to lead? Would you submit your business to me and watch what I do? Submission is the way that we get to love people unconditionally. So I, I can't love people unconditionally without submitting to God. There are people that have hurt me. And in my own strength, I don't know that I could forgive them. I don't know there are people that have hurt you. Maybe churches that have hurt you. And you know churches are just a whole bunch of people. So if a church has hurt you, it wasn't the church, it was people. It was the pastor or it was whatever it might be. But what would it look like for me to let that go? Because I can't forgive some people in my own strength. But I praise my, living, my, my, my Father and the living God that he gives me the power to forgive. That I can forgive because of who he is in me. And that's where freedom has come in my life. See, submission is how we love people unconditionally. Give up your rights to 
have to pay back what they've done to you and just love them unconditionally. See, Ezra led us in a time of giving, of generosity this morning, and I, I believe that that's why God wants us to tithe. God wants us to tithe because he wants us to, to submit our need to be in control of our money. He, say, he says, will you trust me? Yeah, I trust you, Lord. I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my kids. I trust you with, will you trust me with your giving? Oh, hang on. And I think God knows. God knows what grabs a hold of us. He knows what we grab tightly. And for many of us, we've been told to, you know, to, 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 to look after and to budget and to do those things. And that's important. But some of us hold on to our, our finances so tightly, God can't breathe into them. And maybe this morning for you, you've, you may have never tithed, may have never, never given, given just the first, fruit, first fruits of your income to the kingdom of God. God doesn't need your money, but he wants to grow you. And maybe this is an area for you to start to think about, I need to submit this to him and trust him. And it'll help you to set you free from seeding anger or bitterness that rises up when someone doesn't act the way you think they should act or they treat you badly. It means being free to obey Jesus' command that says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. See, when we submit to him, we can do that. When we try and do it in our own strength, I can't. How many are so appreciative that we have a God who gives freedom and leads the way in this area of our lives? Creates a way where I'm not going to live my life bitter because of what people have said and done, about, done to me or said about me. I'm going to, not going to live bitter because I'm going to let that go. Not because I have the strength to do it. Because Jesus says, do this, submit this to me and watch the freedom I bring into your life. And I don't know how many here, but I know I experience that every day. As I commit and I submit to him in this area of my life. See, the cornerstone of this discipline of submission is Jesus' atoning statement. And you'll find it in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. He says this about submission. Mark chapter 8 verse 34 says this. It says, if anyone would come after me, yeah, yep, I want to come after you. Let them deny themselves. Submit. Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will need to lose it, will need to submit it. But whoever loses their life, submits their life for my sake, for me and for the gospel, will save their life. See, the whole concept of Christianity is saying, I'm going to submit my life to you, God, so that I might find my life, the fullness of my life, the life you want me to live, the life that brings freedom. Spend some time this week in Mark chapter 8, 34 and 35. Allow that to, to flow over you. But unfortunately, we're, we're more comfortable with self-fulfillment and self-satisfaction than self-denial. So how many of us have never asked someone to pray for them? Yet the scriptures say pray for one another. Yet self-acceptance says I can do this myself. Satisfaction says, I don't need that. I can, I'm, I'm okay on my own. Self-denial, submission says, Bible says, pray for one another. I want to pray for you and would you pray for me? Simple act. And as I said, later on this morning, in a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity of coming forward and being prayed for. And believing that God is going to bring freedom into your life just because you step into this discipline of submission. Not because of the, the articulate prayers that people will pray of you, although I'm sure they will be. But it's not about the words that they pray, it's about the heart that you bring and the heart that the person who's coming to pray prays for. Self-denial says, I'm not in control, God, you are. That's what submission's about. And Jesus made this ability to love ourselves as a prerequisite. So you see, submission is not, and, and self-denial is not stopping, not being in a place where you don't recognise who you are in him. Check it out. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That's the first and greatest commandment. Get the second one. And the second is equally important, love your neighbour as yourself. See, the ability, the ability to, to step in is to sa sacrifice and to submit yourself to God and say, God, you love me and you love every person whom I set eyes on. So you have not set eyes on any person ever in your life that Jesus didn't die for. No matter what they said to you and no matter what they've done to you, no matter how many fingers they pointed up at you when you were driving really badly and you drove past them, 
God looks at them and says, I love them. And I want you to love them. Every one of them. More than once, Jesus has made it clear that this concept of submission is the only way to love ourselves and love others. Mark chapter 8 says, If any one of you would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. What does it mean to do that? It means, God, may my life be less of me and more of you. What would it look like in your moment of solitude and your moment of submission to pray that prayer? God, may my life be less of me, less of my desires, less of my will, less of what I want. God, creator of the universe, God who knew me before I was born, God who scheduled every day of my life, what would it look like if it was more of you in my life? One of the beautiful ways of our journey with God and this whole idea of submission is the whole idea of baptism. Now we in this church believe that the Bible is really clear that it says believe and be baptised. When we come to an age where we accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, Jesus says the next step is, is to be baptised in water. And he modelled that for us. And he got John the Baptist who said, oh, I shouldn't be baptising you, Jesus. You should be baptising me. And Jesus said, no, 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 let this be done because it is written this way. What he was saying was, let this be done because I want all my followers, when they come to a time in their life, no matter what age they are, where they accept me, I want them to walk into the waters of baptism. Now, we, we celebrate children and we do child dedications regularly in this church. We don't baptise children because they're not at an, babies because they're not at an age where they've made their own decisions. So we dedicate them and parents say, I recognise that this is a child, is a gift from you, God, and I give them back to you and ask your blessing over. It's a beautiful moment, those child dedications. Beautiful moment. Powerful moment. But you know what's more powerful? When what we do something that the world looks at and goes, what the heck? You mean you jump into a tank and you let, let some man or some woman dip you under the water and then bring you up out of the water? What are you thinking? I'm thinking submission. I'm thinking that's what Jesus did and that's what he taught and that's what he wants me to do. And so being baptised as a believer isn't going against the beautiful heritage that your family may have created when you were, were baptised as a child. It's not saying that was wrong. It's beautiful. What a beautiful heritage that your parents would do that. But being baptised as a believer says, on top of that, I stand on the shoulders of the heritage of my parents. But no matter what age I am, 12, 13, 32, 34, 70, 80, because his dad got baptised in his 60s, 70s. He looked 70. <laughs> I can say that he's in Melbourne now. He can't find me. Doesn't matter what age you are. It's, it's being ready to step into the things of God and say, if it's good enough for you, Jesus, is good enough for me. And what, why would he want that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, baptism is, is kind of the, the death of the old life and the starting of a new life. Coming out of the water is the starting of a new life. So it, it symbolises something. My old life without you, God, is gone and my new life with you is reborn, is starting again. But it does something in, in, in your spirit when you're obedient to the things of God. And it says something to the people around you. It's a, it's a witness to what's going on. It's saying, I submit God to you. And if, you, if, if you've not been baptised before, I would love to talk to you about that after the service. Feel free to come up and chat with me. We've got a couple of guys at the moment who have said, yep, I want to be baptised. Um, and we're, we're setting a date for that, which is awesome. Give, encourage them. Yeah. A couple of guys just this week that we've caught, talk, caught up with and they've said, Mario, I want to be baptised and let, let's make that happen. And we, it's just a beautiful moment. We're going to be doing that. Submission. Apostle James, the... the um, Brother of Jesus says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll free from you. The Apostle Peter, who was known as a rebel, probably one of the last people you would think would, would, would uh, submit, says, submit yourself to the Lord for the Lord's sake and to every human authority. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, in, in, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to the elders. So it's not just submitting yourself to God. There are people in our lives where we need to be prepared to submit ourselves. Submit yourself to your elders. 
all of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud and shows favour to the humble. And then, of course, there's that passage in Ephesians that we all know really well. Wives, submit to your husbands. Yeah, we all know that one. We don't realise, though, do we, that in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, before we get there, look what it says. Can we bring the Ephesians one up? It says in 5.21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. That's the first verse. That's verse 21. And then it says, Wives, submit to yourselves to, to your husbands. And it goes on and talks about just as, just as your husbands do to the Lord. So there's a whole bunch of submission going on. It's submit to one another. We forget to read that. <laughs> submit to one another. Wives, submit to your husbands. But do it in a way just as your husband is submitting to the Lord. See, submission flows backwards and forwards and it goes every way. You and I are called to pursue God, to linger with Him, to surrender to Him, to take solitude with Him and to submit to Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The writer of Proverbs says, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him. That's what, the, that's what follow him means, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. So this morning, in this moment of solitude, in this moment of submission, there might be something going on in your world and you, I, just, I just need to submit this to God. I need to submit this to God, Murray. Now's the time. The team is just going to play. We're not going to have a big song at the end. Ez is not going to come up. We're just going to go into a time of prayer right now. What does that prayer look like? It looks like opening your heart to him and coming forward to him. But before we do that, before I open up an opportunity for our team to pray, I want to pray for you. And I particularly want to pray for you if you're in this room and you've never asked Jesus to be, you've never submitted your life to Jesus before. Will we bow our heads?